hey, I need you to stop freaking out about autophagy. Stop worrying about your fasting regimen. Stop worrying about your intermittent fasting protocol based upon autophagy. Look at autophagy is awesome. It's quite honestly probably one of the most powerful gifts that nature has given our bodies. The ability to recycle old portions of a cell and recycle broken pieces of DNA. But it's not the end all be all. And it's not this linear equation. For example, the longer you fast, you don't necessarily get more autophagy that goes with a longer fast. We have different rates of autophagy that are occurring at different times within our body, within different tissues. And I'm going to help you understand this so that you can relax a little bit and maybe not be quite so stressed out about autophagy. So anyhow, what is autophagy? Well, to make matters very, very simple, autophagy is your body trying to find homeostasis at the cellular level by turning over specific proteins and turning over different portions of a cell. So basically, when you are starving or when you're under stress, the body says, well, we don't need this portion of a cell because it's just wasted material right now, so let's go ahead and just recycle it and eat it. So basically the cells eat themselves in order to get more energy. Now this is upregulated and upscaled during times of stress because of course there's more stress and more impact on the cell. But there's two kinds of autophagy that you need to know about. And this gets a little bit complex, but we'll make it really simple and have some fun with it. Okay. There's macro autophagy, which is the kind of autophagy that we generally hear about. Macro autophagy is where you have something known as an autophagosome, which is basically like a little spherical let's think of it like a, like a little device that runs around the cell like a little Roomba vacuum cleaner. It runs around and it vacuums up little things that aren't really needed anymore. It runs around and says, oh, I don't need this anymore. Oh, this is some fragmented DNA. We don't need this. Little Roomba's bouncing all over the place. And then it comes back to the lysosome, a portion of the cell, and it dumps the contents. So the Roomba goes around, picks stuff up, comes back, dumps it in the trash, goes through recycling, and then it's food, right? But the other kind is called microautophagy, and microautophagy is actually what occurs more when we are fasting. You see, microautophagy is more like your cell's built-in Pac-Man. Visualize Pac-Man just opening up the mouth and little pieces of DNA and cell structure and things like that coming into the Pac-Man mouth and then gobble, 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 and it eats them up. Okay, when you are in a starvation mode because you're fasting or anything like that, Pac-Man gets activated a little bit more. Now, macroautophagy still occurs too, but we probably see a higher degree of microautophagy occur because it's a quicker influx of food coming in for the cell. Anyhow, that's neither here nor there, but let's talk about what's happening uh, all the time in your body. You see, to some degree, autophagy is always occurring. And that means that we don't need to be sitting here worrying about it being exclusive to fasting. You see, when we exercise and we move certain tissues or when we're deprived of specific nutrients at a given point in time, we will have autophagy occur at one area of our body. For example, our muscles might be going through autophagy at a different point than our liver, or our cardiac tissue might be going through autophagy at a different point than our muscles, right? It's just all over the place. Here, I want you to think of it like inflammation for a minute, okay? Inflammation uh, is good and bad, right? So here's a perfect example. If you were to bump your elbow or you bumped your knee uh, or you were to get sick, right? Your inflammatory system, inflammation is going to come to the surface to help heal the issue. But if that was constantly, chronically elevated, it would be a problem, right? Okay, well, it's the same thing with autophagy. Autophagy is great because recycling cellular components. But if it was happening all the time, we'd waste away, we'd have nothing left. Right? So it's the same thing. We don't want it to occur all the time. So I see way too many people that are getting concerned because they're stopping autophagy or they're concerned about that. Don't be. It's going to be on and off all the time and we need it to be on and we need it to be off. It's not linear. It's more like a web-like kind of labyrinth of different things that activate autophagy at different times. You see, us depriving ourselves of nutrients during a fast might be triggering autophagy at the liver level, but perhaps even after we eat and we go for a walk, we're triggering autophagy in the thigh muscles because we're deprived of nutrients to the thigh at some point in time. That's an example, but the point is, it's all over the place. We have different signaling pathways and signaling pathways that turn on autophagy and turn off autophagy. A perfect example is mTOR. mTOR is a growth signaling pathway. Whenever we work out, we're doing high intensity activity and we're lifting weights, we have a degree of mTOR, right? That gets activated and tells our body to store and to build muscle and to grow. That is quite literally the opposite of autophagy, right? Autophagy is recycling and dwindling down. Okay, but another thing that's going to induce autophagy is going to be uh, hypoxia. 
Okay, a good example of this is you're working out to a really high intensity to the point where you're devoid of oxygen in some places. You have put yourself into what's called a hypoxic state. So when you work out at a high intensity, you can only take in so much oxygen. So you end up hypoxic to some degree. Some muscles end up, muscle cells end up not getting enough oxygen. Well, guess what? Those muscle cells will go through autophagy at that point in time in an effort to conserve. Okay, there's not enough oxygen coming in, so why should we be wasting energy operating mitochondria that don't have the ability to even process oxygen because there's not enough oxygen? Might as well kill them off or recycle it. Okay, so that's sort of a mitochondrial autophagy that occurs there. My point with this is simple. It's that we have different signaling pathways, but now let's have a little bit of fun with it because the big trigger is going to be starvation. That's the most scientifically researched, the most backed. We know we have all these different triggers, hypoxia, mTOR, this, that, but the main one is nutrient deprivation or nutrient starvation, with the big one being the total depletion of all amino acids. Okay, so in other words, when we're not eating at all, we have a very clear line of autophagy going up, okay? But that's because we have no aminos coming in. Now, just to give you an understanding here, aminos aren't just in the protein that you eat. Aminos are the building blocks of protein, but you might consume some asparagus and get a couple aminos, and you might consume some olives and get a couple aminos, you might consume some coffee and get a couple aminos, or you might consume a steak and get all your aminos. But the point is, is at some point you're getting all kinds of different amino acids. So when total amino acids are low, autophagy is triggered. But each individual amino acid triggers autophagy or disrupts autophagy at a different rate. So let me explain this in a little bit of a simpler way with an example. Let's just take two random amino acids. Let's take leucine and glutamine, okay? Leucine might have a powerful effect in terms of stopping autophagy, but glutamine, maybe not so much. So what am I getting at with this? Well, it means that certain things that you consume might break a fast and certain things that you consume might not, but it gets more advanced than that. Here's where all the variables come into play. Okay, for example, that same leucine has a different effect on muscle autophagy than it does on liver autophagy. And that same glutamine that I was talking about has a different effect on liver autophagy than it does on muscle autophagy than it does on brain autophagy. So if you're following me here, I know this is complicated, there are lots of different moving pieces. Each individual amino acid disrupts autophagy at a different level within each and every form of tissue and cell within our body. Because autophagy is not a simple on-off switch. It's on and off at the cellular level of each given type of cell. Okay, it occurs in every cell within our body. So for someone to say, oh, this stops autophagy, is completely wrong because that sip of coffee that I had during a fast might have stopped autophagy. But where? I don't know. That piece of chicken that I had definitely stopped autophagy. But maybe that flavored water that had some random amino in it, maybe that stopped autophagy in my left toe. You get what I'm saying here, right? One thing that's going to help all of this make a lot of sense is looking at how our different cells process autophagy and go through autophagy. We've now seen that the liver goes through autophagy the fastest, okay? It tends to go through autophagy the quickest and it's the most impactful, probably because the liver is the most involved with metabolism, right? Whenever we eat something, something comes in, the liver is handling it. So when we don't eat something, we're gonna see liver autophagy occur fast. But another thing that we've noticed is that muscle cells, particularly type two muscle cells, like those that are used, uh, the fast switch ones, those that are used in strength and sprinting, those tend to go through autophagy really quick too. Well, what does that really mean? It means that cells that are more active are gonna go through autophagy sooner because they are hungry all the time. The more active the cell, the more fuel it usually needs. So when it is deprived of its fuel, it's going to panic and go through autophagy faster. Now, one interesting exception is gonna be the brain. You see, the brain doesn't go through a lot of autophagy. Even after long periods of fast, it's hard to measure autophagy occurring in the brain. Why is that? Because as modern day mammals, our brain is probably our most powerful survival mechanism. So when we're fasting, our body is going to reallocate resources from our body to our brain. So again, just because we don't have autophagy occurring in the brain doesn't mean that autophagy is not occurring in the rest of the body. So it's a simple thing there, but it gets the point across. 
So another thing that's really interesting, when you look at a study that was published in PNAS, it found that when you do a longer fast, like a 48-hour fast, you actually have a down regulation of autophagy later on in the fast. Really? What's going on here? Okay, so here's what's interesting. 48-hour fast, nice long fast. You would think that you have a bunch of autophagy occurring all the time. Well, guess what? Autophagy just turns on once you're in starvation mode, period. It doesn't really change a whole lot the deeper the fast that you get into once you're actually devoid of nutrients. What's interesting is this study found that microautophagy actually slowed down towards the end of a 48-hour fast, and protein turnover, protein degradation, slowed down, meaning you were actually using and wasting less protein at the end of a long fast than you were at the beginning. This probably has something to do with the fact that your body has upregulated ketones, and ketones are making it so that you're not uh, breaking down as much protein, but that's a little bit more complex. We don't need to go there. So the cool thing is that macro autophagy stayed elevated the whole time. And then once the fast was broken, it plummeted. That makes sense, right? Macro autophagy, autophagy at the big level was elevated, but micro autophagy at the small cellular level was slowly going down towards the end of the fast. So the point with that is that you can't base your entire like validation of your fast on autophagy. Okay, there's so many other factors that are coming into play. However, let me go ahead and give you some quick ways that you can improve your autophagy levels, even if you're not fasting. So you can do these while you're fasting or not. Of course, the number one is going to be nutrient deprivation. Fast with as little intake of anything as possible. Dry fasting could be a really, really powerful way to do it. Another thing that I do is while I'm fasting, I consume lion's mane. So lion's mane promotes autophagy just through other mechanisms, through other genetic mechanisms and different processes. Um, if you've heard of Four Sigmatic, I put a link down below for Four Sigmatic. So it's a form of mushroom coffee that can potentially help induce autophagy. So I definitely recommend you check them out. Special link down below if you're watching this video. Okay, the other thing is lower intensity exercise, just getting moving. Anything where you're getting your body to have to utilize nutrients and get rid of them faster is going to put those tissues under stress so they go through autophagy. Coffee. The polyphenols induce autophagy. Again, perfect example that it's not as black and white as we think. Different mechanisms from the coffee that we consume are triggering autophagy at different tissue level, mainly in the liver. Same thing with tea. Okay, green tea induces autophagy via EGCG in the liver, in the hepatic tissue. They've noticed increases in hepatic autophagosomes when green tea or matcha green tea is consumed. Turmeric's another one, mainly through the regulation of nuclear factor kappa B. So when we downregulate inflammation, then for some reason autophagy seems to upregulate too. A lot of different pieces that we don't fully understand. Okay, but the adaptogenic piece, using ashwagandha, using lion's mane, using reishi, using these adaptogens, that is one way that we are seeing at the genetic level some manipulation with some of these autophagosomes and this whole stage of autophagy. Again, the world is still trying to discover exactly what's going on with this. I think we're barely scratching the surface, but there are little things that you can do. Main thing is, don't stress about it. Autophagy is going to happen when it happens. You focus on the element of mastery and the mental fortitude that you can build by practicing fasting. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'm sorry for all the lengthy explanations here, but I'll see you in the next video.